Hello and welcome to CD Oasis. My name is Shiraz Gesayer. I am very pleased to welcome once again our creative contributor to CD Oasis through his mentorship series, Dr. Paul Benziki. By now, uh, most of you know that Dr. Benziki is a dental surgeon from Toronto in private practice for close to four decades. What you may not know, and for which we're extremely grateful, is the amount of time and effort he dedicates to create the CD Oasis, valuable CD Oasis knowledge nuggets. Dr. Belziki, I am very uh, happy to see you again and welcome you on Oasis. Hello Shiraz, it's very good to be here. So you are presenting a very interesting case today. Can you briefly tell our audience what the case is about and why is it important for you to bring it forward? Well, um, it's a case that involves root resorption, which you don't encounter every day. And it's where the root resorption was located and the difficulties in managing it, which involve the three phases of dentistry, which I provide every day, which is periodontal surgery, endodontics, and restorative dentistry. Um, and just thinking I could manage everything. And this is a case where I ran into a problem and I had to call in a specialist, which doesn't happen in my office every day. So it gave pause to reflect on knowing your own limitations. Perfect. So shall we go and see the case? Yes, we shall. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the title is Nocite Ipsum, which is something that Socrates said to those of his generation. It's part of his philosophy of living, which is know thyself. And my son-in-law thought a lot of this uh, statement, so he, he had it tattooed on the back of his calf, and you can see here it is. And what does that mean? What did Socrates mean by this? Well, he thought that the unexamined life is not worth living. And those were part of his philosophical principles. So let's update this, put it into modern terms and modern phrase. And let's say there is worth in reflecting on one's career because we have to, I'm trying to put this within the context of dentistry. And more so it's, you have to know thy limitations. And somebody such as myself, you know, I, I got an ego and I think I can do everything. And sometimes you get caught. And here's, here's one instance. So for those of you new to me, let me tell you that I'm a general practitioner here in Toronto. I graduated in 79. And over the course of that career, I've managed to learn periodontal surgery, endodontics, and restorative dentistry. And I think I'm pretty good at it. And I endeavor to integrate these protocols to deliver long lasting restorations because that's what patients want. They want a problem fixed, they want it fixed right, and they want it fixed once, and they want it to last. Nobody likes to come back to be drilled on. So it's a resulted in a career that's intellectually stimulating because it's technically challenging. I mean, there's difficulties in managing everything. There's really no such thing as a simple filling. Everything has its own unique demands that have to be met and overcome. But the downside to this is uh, it's rather isolating. Being a solo practitioner, uh, here all by myself, I, I don't have associates, and I don't refer much out. So there's very little interaction with other colleagues. That's the downside. So I usually say here, and I'm doing it old school in the pursuit of excellence. Now that doesn't mean that I'm old fashioned and I'm stuck in old ways. It's just I have good results managing problems the way I have for a given number of decades. And I don't want to move to anything new unless it's going to offer benefit to me. So achieving excellence, if that's what we're after, in any field of endeavor requires years of dedication that borders on obsession. And the, these stories are always, when you, when you listen to documentaries, they're always true, particularly in the lives of successful athletes or musicians where they're in the public eye. And when interviewed, they'll tell you, I had to work damn hard to master what I was doing. And this is Brian Adams. He's a Canadian rocker. And back in the day, he penned a song, The Summer of 69. And one of the lines is, I got my real first six string and I played it till my fingers bled. Now, I understand what he meant by this. He wanted to master that instrument, that guitar, and he knew he would play it and play the same lick over and over again until he got it just right. He had a, um, an image in his mind of what 
sound he wanted to make, and he had to struggle to have his fingers make that sound. So every now and again, I get a real four canaler, long and calcified, where finding the MB2 can be challenging. Sometimes you don't even see it. You just kind of know where it is by experience, and you just fall into it with the file. And you have to play these for a long time, and sometimes you have to play them until your fingers bleed too. And these are all the instruments I use just to get that one MB2 canal. Pecking down and I could feel it yield and doing these over the course of many years, you know that, that it's going, you know you're gonna get there. There's a certain feel that your fingers have learned that if you just stay with it, with a bit of tenacity, you'll get down to the apex. And there's the final result. So I'm pretty proud of myself. I think, boy, am I ever good? And I just don't need anybody. I can manage everything on my own in the course of my career, I haven't sent out many endos. Well, interestingly enough, in 2005, a young dentist showed up in my office, presented himself, Dr. Monkars, I just graduated endo, and I started a practice across the street, and could you please send me some cases? So I showed him a few cases that I've done, and I said, look, I do all my own cases. I'm just as good as any endodontist. And really, you can't expect much from me because in the course of the career, maybe like a dozen cases at the most. But boy, I'd really like to be friends because I do all this on my own, and it's rather isolating. It's nice to have somebody fresh close to me, and could we be buddies? And he was nice enough that uh, we did develop a very good friendly relationship. There are nights where I'll call him, he stays late, I stay late, we'll get in the car and drive home. And we'll talk about cases that we've done on the way home. Oh, I wish I could get points for all the dentistry we talk about. And his, one of his favorite saying is, did you command the apex? So in 2007, I got a curious case of some ill-defined awareness patient said, it's not really pain, just every now and again, I feel something going on. And I took a radiograph and I couldn't see much other than, yes, she had had ortho, a bicuspid was missing, and uh, the wisdom tooth was removed some years ago. But these just looked like perfect teeth, you know, with sinus issues. I really couldn't see anything that could attribute an endodontic source, sorry, a, a, a an odontogenic source. So I kept following that over, over the course of time. And, and there was a little something happening there, but I just wrote that off to an artifact. And then in 2005, took another film. It, there was never any pain, just something was bugging her. And then in 2007, I took this film. And then I could see this is growing. This is no longer artifact. It doesn't look like the other films. There's something going on here. Again, more of an awareness, no pain, and maybe some thermal sensitivity, but not much. And there's the lesion, I've outlined it here. And I can tell that's at the crest of bone. And when I get into that, at, I'm, I'll be subcrestal because the lesions are usually bigger once you get in there than how they present on a radiograph. There's the bone. And the skin was all bunched up on the distal end of it. So I know that I'm, that I'm into what we would call comprehensive dentistry. I've got to do endo, perio, and restorative. Now the question becomes, in what sequence? And they, they can be different. You can manage the different phases at different times, depending on the needs of any particular case. So in the back of my mind, whenever I do anything in dentistry, there's rule one. I can't fool mother nature. I, I just can't do something thinking, well, I'm just, I'm just a god and whatever I do will, will last. I have to respect the biology. And in this case, because the lesion was subgingival, approaching the crest of bone, I know I'll be violating the biologic with, and I have to manage that. That's the perio part. And of course, uh, we're all familiar with the schematic of what that complex looks like. Here it is in histological section. And if we enlarge that, we know that there's the tooth, here's the enamel, there's a gingival sulcus, there's a potential space. We know we have our epithelial attachment and it's glued to the enamel. And of course, uh, we've got the connective tissue that inserts into root structure. 
with collagen fibers. And this biologic width is only two millimeters, two and a half at best. So when we come in with restorative materials, ideally what we would like to do is just tuck it into the sulcus and go no further. But chasing decay, it's not a perfect world. Sometimes we find ourselves a little bit deeper. And if we're careful and we have a nice smooth restorative material where you run from enamel to, to, your, uh, to your crown or your filling, and if it's smooth, the body will accept that. But you don't want to do that. You don't want to have a margin that's stuck out into the skin off of the tooth structure because you'll end up with a foreign body reaction. And as you get deeper and deeper, picking up these impressions, picking up what you've prepared, either conventionally with VPS impression as I do, or digitally, you know, if the skin's flopping back and forth, you have to manage that. And of course, that's the last thing you want to do, which is just slam some restorative material into the connective tissue attachment. Now you might say, well, it's the back of a molar, like who cares if it bleeds and nobody will know. I'll know. I'll know and the skin will know and it'll bleed. And every time you go back there, it, it won't be, it, yes, the bone, it may recede in some fashion, but if it's off by a little bit, it might as well be off by a mile. And I don't like being off. So here, managing that whole complex, there you can see it. And here are the teeth, virgin teeth, no restorations. So how to start? Well, before I commit to uh, an endodontic procedure, which is expensive, I want to determine what's the extent of the lesion. Is it indeed where I think it is? And is the tooth restorable? So the first thing I did was just cut down with a simple DO preparation, and I fell into a gelatinous mass. So at this point, knowing that I would do the periodontal surgery and the endo, I usually do this all in one appointment, one long appointment. So I took a band and I forced it as hard as I could, deep down, to try to get to the bottom of where that lesion extended to, and, and then just scooped it out and placed some flowable resin material, just so I could have some isolation while doing the endo. And in very short order, I found myself in the palatal canal, and that went quite nicely, and I thought, boy, boy, am I a genius. And then I, I got into the buccal canals, and it just wasn't going. Something in my fingers after years of picking in canals, poking in canals, I thought, something's not going right. And I found that it was difficult. It was difficult for me to find or see the canals. And this was just an odd shape root anatomy. So I had to make a decision. At what point do I give up? So I have to consider, how can I best guarantee success? And in order to, do, to pull this off, I need to have the ideal endodontic outcome. And if I don't think that I can pull that off, I have no interest in making money. I would rather find somebody that could. So I didn't want to complicate the case by altering or destroying whatever natural chamber anatomy would guide the next guy in so he could pull off an ideal endodontic outcome. So after three years or two years, I called up Andrew and I said, I've got a case for you. Thank you very much, Paul. And I said, well, wait till you see it. Don't, don't be too quick to thank me. And this is what came back. Now, when, when I hear people talk about what they do, or I go to lectures and, and talk to colleagues, about, everybody talks a big ball game. I'm fastidious, attention to detail. Yes, yes, I'm wonderful. And I always say, look, show me a radiograph. Show me a study model. Show me a picture of what you do because talk is cheap. And I looked at this and I thought, boy, I couldn't do that. And I thought to myself, you know, phoned up, phoned up Drew and said, thank you. And did you command the apex? That's his favorite phrase. And in this case, he did. And he commanded it quite well because here is the palatal. There's the distal buckle. And the mesiobuccal canal actually extends distally. I'd never seen this before. And the fact that somebody could pull this off, I knew the man has skills. And as Paul alluded to, the anatomy 
was a little bit unusual. And 11 years later, I, I think I would have approached this a little bit differently. Endodontics continues to evolve. And, uh, and so it's interesting to go back and to see treatment that you've rendered in a different stage in professional life and to be critical. And so in a case like this, that really is a, an issue of manual dexterity and tenacity. It's a very hard thing to explain. It would be much easier to show, but obviously we can't really show it. Um, so the, the message that I was hoping to get across today with regards, if I could teach one concept or just sort of impart one idea regarding endodontic treatment, and it's applicable universally, it's the idea of access. So when we talk about endo, really our, our objectives, we, we are trying to clean and seal the inside of the canal system in order to either prevent infection and the resulting inflammation in the periapical bone, or we are trying to clean a contaminated canal system and to seal it to allow for bony healing. And so really everyone focuses on shaping. And, and when we look at it, when we look at a, 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 an x-ray with white stripes, we, we critique the white stripes, really what we're trying to do is to infer how well we cleaned the canal system. So it's an indirect gauge of how well we cleaned it is how well we're able to seal it. But if you think about it, really what we're trying to do in endodontic treatment is we're trying to clean the canal system. And the science tells us that the majority of the cleaning is chemical. It is not a mechanical process. So really what we're doing with endodontic treatment with shaping, which is what everyone focuses on, what file system do you use? How did you do this one? You know, how, 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 how do you know what you're working like this? What, say, what size did you use? What taper? What kind of gutta percha? Thermophil? Warm vertical? But really what we're trying to do is we are trying to instrument the canal space in order to allow our irrigants to penetrate and to disinfect or to debride the canal space. And really, the, the message here, you know, how do I do this? Well, it's not an easy answer, but basically, philosophically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to extend my access as far up inside the canal system as I can, because most of the anatomical variations, most of the difficulties that we face are in the apical one-third. That if we can philosophically guide our access into the apical third, the junction of the middle and apical thirds of a root, then what that does is that allows us to focus mentally and to use our limited sort of manual dexterity, that degree of concentration in the part that's very, very important. And so what I did here, the cursor is visible, is, and this was sort of the philosophy 10 years ago, was I tried to establish what we call straight line access. And what I tried to do was to join a line between the cusp tip, the pulp horn, the floor of the chamber, and the junction in this case of the coronal and middle thirds of the tooth. So we have a big straight line here. And 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I was very, very happy with this because it allowed me to get around and then I was able to navigate this gentle S shape. And really what it allowed me to do was to extend my access to here. I didn't have to worry about any of this anatomy. And then I had to worry about this. But the flip side, now what we're learning in endo as far as survival of teeth is that the pericervical dentin, four millimeters uh, below the height of the crest and maybe two, three millimeters above the height of the crest, is really the trunk of the tooth is the critical area for survival, for strength and structural rigidity of the tooth. And that now, 10, 11 years later, I would have approached this differently. In my opinion, now looking at this and being critical of my own work, this is quite wide. And at the time, this would have been ProTaper that I used. So those of you who are familiar with ProTaper, S1, S2, you know, purple and white, purple and white, purple and white, and then yellow and then red and then maybe blue. Uh, so when we talk about the dentinal triangle, it shows up nicely on this tooth right here where we have the cusp tip, the pulp horn, the floor of the chamber is right here, and then the junction of the coronal and middle thirds of the tooth. So if I draw an outline right here, this is the dentinal triangle. And for a long time in endodontics, this is what we were teaching, remove the dentinal triangle. A lot of dentists didn't even know what the dentinal triangle was. And now all of a sudden we're saying, well, maybe we were a little aggressive taking these big pylon, you know, 12 taper orifice shapers, and, and really, really over enlarging the coronal aspect of the chamber. And so now the, the pendulum has swung back a little bit and we're trying in fact to shape our canals a little bit more conservatively in the coronal section. But I've got ego and I've, I've got my pride. And I said to us, so I said to Andrew, look, now that you've commanded the apices, I have to command everything else. I've got to take care of all of those weak links so I can back up the endo that you've done so expertly. And that's my part now. 
so I have to command margins. So the patient came back, the tooth was asymptomatic, and the first thing I did was do my crown preparation, knowing I would do the, the periodontal surgery all at the same time. But I just wanted everything out of the way, and I wanted to cut away all of the restorative material prior to raising a flap, because I don't want to force that under, under the mucal periosteum and potentially have problems later on. And also, uh, this facilitates doing the crown lengthening. So a flap was raised. Now, here's your comprehensive dentistry. If you want to know that, that buzzword, comprehensive dentistry, this is it. It's treating not only the restorative phase, but the periodontal phase as well. I defined and removed the defect, and it extended to where that green line is. And then I knew I had to develop a margin on tooth structure because a finish line of a crown has to finish ideally on tooth structure, not on restorative material. So I've trimmed that down, made a nice long bevel because part of the management is what's going to be placed here. And what's going to be placed is a metal margin, either a full gold crown or a PFM. And now I know I'm banging up against bone. So I have to come in with end cutting rotary instrumentation and start removing and wrapping some of this bone away so that I can expose cementum for the tissue to insert its collagen fibers into. And doing it at this point is very easy. Notice that the core buildup is not in place because now the light just comes streaming through and every little bit helps, every little bit of light and good visibility helps you do this. And then if I feel, hmm, you know, I need more margin, I can just feather it down a little bit farther and then go ahead and take a little bit more bone away. And then after I'm satisfied, I place my amalgam core buildup. And from p previous posts, you'll know that I love amalgam and I think you should too, because you can put a band on in the presence of a flap where you're not injuring tissue and amalgam will set in the presence of moisture. It doesn't care. And then you just take a hand instrument and just go back and forth, back and forth. You feel where your margin is and you just start removing restorative material until you've defined your margin by hand. You don't want to use a rotary instrument in this, at this point with amalgam because you'll pulverize it and force it under the flap. And I've said that many times. And then I made my provisional cramp. So how did I do? Well, after seven days, the body tells me it's doing pretty good. Uh, you can see that the flap is opposing itself. Uh, there's very little bleeding or redness. And lo and behold, after three months, miraculously, just following sound tenants of periodontal surgery and good restorative dentistry, I've got tissue that's pink and textbook. It doesn't bleed. There's not a drop of blood anywhere. So this facilitates taking your impression, whether it's uh, the new way with uh, digital impression taking, scanning, or my old fashioned way, which is VPS impression material in an acrylic custom tray. And whether it's one tooth over here, I like to take an entire arch because I feel the more information I can give the lab, the better they can make their their decisions on how they are to manufacture this crown. It doesn't cost any more, it doesn't take any more time. And you can see here, I've captured that margin right there and a little bit beyond. So what I like to do in these cases where we find ourselves just a bit sub subgingively is I will take some impression material on the end of a probe and just start to layer it in so that when this is poured up, the lab tech doesn't have to take a rotary instrument and knock off stone and potentially damage that little bit of margin that I've worked so hard to generate because they don't know what I had to go through to get that margin, the perio, and just doing it all. So there it's outlined. And my favorite saying, if you can't see it, neither can anyone else. So I don't like guessing. I don't want anybody to guess. Every impression I sent to the lab is picture perfect. 
That doesn't mean every impression I take is perfect, but the one that gets sent is perfect. And my lab has instructions, so, you know, don't guess. If I've missed it and you're not comfortable, call me. I'll, I'd rather have the patient come back and take another impression rather than get something back. It doesn't fit right. And now I've got to tell the patient, hey, it's not right. And the confidence is lost very, very quickly. There's the stone model and the final crown. A fine metal margin traditionally will end up, if it's cast properly, polished and burnished properly, provides an excellent seal against uh, the ingress of bacteria and will be harmonious, particularly if it's a gold alloy, will be harmonious with the patient's physiology. The day of insertion, and there's the crown in place. Three years later, and everything looks just perfect. There's no bleeding, there's no redness, and the patient, as it should be, is totally unaware of everything that went on. And that's good dentistry. When they don't know anything, you've hit it right. After 10 years, 2017, there's a little bit of recession that's occurred, but that's probably over all of the teeth. As we age, we get some physiological aging and recession. That's how we started. There was the lesion, there was the bone, skin, and here it is today. And very critically, right here, that's the weak link of the whole thing, along with the endodontics, of course, which unfortunately I couldn't manage, but thankfully Andrew did. But that's the weak link, getting that seal there so that you don't get an ongoing periodontal issue and end up with the loss of this tooth. So, Socrates, on reflection, I think it's to practice with a unified vision. You can call that comprehensive dentistry, if you will. And it's to command all critical details to result in long-lasting restorations. If you're plopping your money down and you're sitting in the chair with your mouth open, that's what you would want too. So, thankfully, all the details were, were managed. There. So if I can't attain the ideal, I better find somebody else that can. So no sete ipsum, no thy limitations. You must place the patient's interest above all else. You have to put money aside. If you can't pull it off to a high standard of excellence, refer it to somebody else. When encountering a difficulty, stop sooner than later. A patient will understand and appreciate your judgment. They'll say, boy, you know, he's, he's foregoing making money and sending me somewhere else. Must be a good guy. And this will facilitate the second attempt by a specialist. Because they, they want to look good too. And if it's all beat up, it just makes their life more difficult as well. Now, even though you're, um, there are other specialists that may be involved, it's the GP that inserts the restoration. It's your thumb that squashes that crown onto the tooth and that's the person the patient will remember if there's a problem so you have to guide and you have to coordinate treatment comprehensive management of all aspects with the specialist that you use and this includes the lab phase as well you have to be on top and demand excellence from a lab so endeavor to practice with a unified vision so that you too can have an intellectually stimulating and rewarding career because baby, that ain't old school. That's the only school. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to hearing some of your comments. Have a good day.